Hearing that you have heart failure can be a frightening experience. One way to reduce your fear and anxiety is to learn about the condition and your treatment options. So let's find out about the class system that cardiologists use to rank the stages of heart failure and what are the different treatment options. We're going to find out with Dr. Stuart Russell, Director of Heart Failure at Wake Med Heart and Vascular. This is Wake Med Voices, a podcast from Wake Med Health and Hospitals. I'm Bill Klaproth. Dr. Russell, what is the class system for heart failure and why do cardiologists need and or use this? So the class system for heart failure is really kind of the oldest system that we have and it really separates our patients based on their functional capacity. So we really try to look at the symptoms that the patients are having and and put patients into classes based on that. The benefit of this is it really helps us to understand where a patient is. So we can think about a class one patient differently than a class four patient. So it's almost like a shorthand for communicating um, to get a good feel for where patients are, um, where one doc to another can really have an idea about where their patient is and, and how to think about them. Right. That makes sense. So in addition to the class system, I've also heard about a stage system. How are those different? So the stage system is a newer uh, system, which really kind of takes a patient through through their journey. Where stage A patients are at risk for heart failure, stage B are those who actually have some reduction in function but no symptoms. Uh, stage three have symptoms, and then stage four, or excuse me, uh, stage D are the end stage patients. The difference with between the two systems is. The classes, if you get better, you can go from class four down to class two. The stages, you always progress down this continuum. So you go from stage A to B to C to D. So that helps you rank the degree of heart failure. So what are the four classes and then what are the four stages? Sure. So the classes, again, look at functional capacity. And so class one are patients with disease but really no symptoms. And by symptoms, we really focus on kind of what they do, right? So are you short of breath with activity? And so if the answer to that is no, you're class one. If you're short of breath with moderate activity, which in my mind is kind of walking around the store, walking through the mall, walking, you know, three to six blocks, then you're class two. As you progress and get worse, Short of breath with minimal activity, it's class three. And minimal activity for me uh, is can you carry groceries in from the car? Can you walk a flight of stairs? Mm -hmm. And then the class four patients are those who really are short of breath with almost no activity or arrest. So are you getting short of breath getting dressed in the morning? Uh, In my mind, is a class four. Okay. Flip-flop that the other way to the stages. And you've got stage A heart failure, which are patients at risk for heart failure. And so these are people who have either coronary artery disease or diabetes or hypertension. So the risk factors for heart failure, but really haven't manifested any signs of heart failure yet. Stage B are those when their heart isn't functioning normally, but have no symptoms. So that would be similar kind of to a class one patient. Stage C are those who both have functional reductions in in function as well as symptoms. So that's your class two and class three patients. And then stage D heart failure is really patients who are who are really at the end of the road and we're thinking about heart transplant or left ventricular assist devices and things like that for them. So you were just talking about symptoms such as shortness of breath. Are there other symptoms that people would experience in each of these stages and or classes and what is their quality of life like in each? The classifications are really kind of a functional type thing. Um, And so it is, what do you do with activity? So from that aspect, I would say no. But as you go through these, there are similar things that patients get. So patients that are class one or class two really are pretty good. But as they get to class three, they'll start to have swelling in their legs. Uh, they may get swelling in their abdomen, and so they get feel like they're always bloated. Uh, when they lay down at night, just having gravity kind of bring more fluid up toward their lungs makes them short of breath. And so they're propping up on two or three pillows to sleep, or they wake up in the middle of the night short of breath. 
class four patients again, almost when they think about doing something, they start to get short of breath because they're so limited in terms of what their cardiac function reserve is. Okay, got it. So let's talk about treatment then. What methods of treatment do you use for each stage in class? So the kind of cornerstones of treatment for heart failure uh, are are meds, and um, and from a class perspective, the differences in class to some extent are related to how much extra fluid patients have on board. And so as they get symptomatic, a lot of those symptoms are related to having fluid. And so we use diuretics to just get people to to urinate out the extra fluid. Additionally, there's a lot of medications that we, we give them. And so patients will be on an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist. Um, uh, depending on the race, we may change the medicines that they're on. And so there's about four or five different meds that once patients hit class two and class three, they're always going to be on for kind of optimal medical therapy. The nice thing about the stages now, in the past, we thought of stage A, this kind of risk for heart failure, uh, as a group that wasn't really within the heart failure domain. Um, you know, in all the guidelines, they talk about preventing or treating the, the risk factors uh, like we normally do, but there was no kind of real heart failure-specific stuff. Over the past year to two, there's been a lot of data coming out with the new diabetic medications. Uh, showing really a reduction in heart failure progression um, with some of these medications. And so I think uh, in contrast to five years ago, heart failure docs are really now focusing on diabetes and saying we need to, to make sure that patients with type 2 diabetes are on the right medications because it can really, I think, make an impact in terms of whether they will or won't progress to actually having heart failure. That's a really interesting link. What about lifestyle changes for people that are in the lower classes? Is it possible to exercise more, eat better, stop drinking alcohol, stop smoking? Do those things help? So definitely smoking. Uh, there was a study that came out this summer uh, that looked at there's these seven kind of life simple seven, they called it, uh, things that you can do. So losing weight, exercising, having your diabetes treated, smoking, blood pressure. And of those seven, the things that seem to have the biggest impact were stopping smoking, treating your blood sugar, and then the third was losing weight. Uh, and so if you can get on those and really work to get to a more healthier lifestyle, I think this is, again, data from just following people over time, but data that would suggest you're going to reduce your chances of having heart failure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. So what services then do you offer at WakeMed to help patients in each of these stages and or classes? Yeah, so I think the big thing that we do is we take a look at each individual patient and say, are you on the right medications? Uh, there's a lot of medications that people are supposed to be on. Uh, a lot of times uh, they either have trouble getting on them or they just don't want to do it because it's a lot of different pills. And so we add an extra layer of push to make that happen. We also have support from a pharmacist uh, who will come to clinic and, and help you get up to the highest dose of medications because there's some good data that higher doses are better than lower doses. As you progress down and get worse, uh, a lot of these patients end up getting hospitalized. And one of the nice things that we have here is we can give IV diuretics, so intravenous diuretics, in the clinic instead of having to go to the hospital. I got a call just last night about somebody who's gained 17 pounds. I think five years ago, she would have been sent to the emergency room and she'd be admitted right now. Instead, today, she's going to come in and we're going to give her intravenous diuretics in our clinic, and then if that doesn't do the trick, she can come back tomorrow. She can come back uh, the day after that. And so we can kind of do inpatient medicine as an outpatient. Additionally, for those patients who are really at the end of the line, there's a collaboration between Duke and Wake Med, uh, and so we can easily get patients uh, worked up for heart transplant, for left ventricular assist devices, and kind of some of those advanced therapies 
those are done at Duke, but then they come back here for follow-up at WakeMed after. Well, it's good to know about those advanced therapies and the collaboration that you have with organizations such as Duke. Dr. Russell, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thanks. My pleasure. That's Dr. Stuart Russell, Director of Heart Failure at WakeMed Heart and Vascular. And to request an appointment with WakeMed Heart and Vascular Services or just to learn more, please visit hearts.wakemed.com. Org. That's hearts.wakemed.org. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels and check out the full podcast library for topics of interest to you. I'm Bill Klaproth with WakeMed Voices, brought to you by WakeMed Health and Hospitals in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thanks for listening.